That was Bungalow Way by the Explorers at 29 minutes past 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Wichita's number one station for rock and roll, 1240 KAKE. It's 63 degrees out at Wichita's Mid-Continent Airport, where there's a report that the new Learjet we've all been hearing about has actually taken off in the past half hour on its first ever test flight. It's expected to return before dark, which is about an hour from now. That might be something worth seeing. In other news, President Kennedy announced today at his weekly press conference. On the evening of October 7, 1963, there was a traffic jam in Wichita. On, of all places, the stretch of K-42 between Hoover and Tyler Roads at the south end of Mid-Continent Airport. More than 100 cars were pulled off to the side of the road. Their headlights were visible from the runways and from the Learjet plant at the north end of the field. They were also visible from 5,000 feet in the air and two miles to the south where the first Learjet, a Model 23, was making its approach. According to the pilots of that new jet aircraft, it was a sight to behold, headlights literally marking the Learjet's way back to the ground at the end of its very first flight. It was also the beginning of an era and an industry, business aviation, that has now reached its 40th year. I'm Roger Cornish, and this is the story of that historic flight, the man who put his fortune on the line to make it happen, and the airplane that became the epitome of business aircraft performance and a household word in the process. Recently, a group of original Learjet employees, men who remember Bill Lear, the birth of the Learjet and business aviation, gathered to reminisce about those early days. Bill Lear was born in Hannibal, Missouri, a year before the Wright brothers first flew. He moved to Chicago as a boy and grew up there. A precocious youngster with a bent for technical things, he earned an early reputation for ingenuity and a disdain for boring schoolwork. Quitting school in the eighth grade, he set out to be an innovator and inventor. By his early 20s, he had developed the first practical car radio, a Victrola for the motor vehicle, or Motorola. He began amassing his first fortune when he sold the rights to the device to the company that still bears that name. Moving on to the fledgling aviation industry, Bill applied his creative talents to enhancing navigation. The self-taught engineer eventually designed and built the Learoscope, the first automatic direction finder and first practical autopilot. By the time he was in his 30s, he was a well-known force in aviation. In 1954, he won the prestigious Collier Trophy for inventing the F-86 autopilot. By the mid-50s, Bill Lear held a number of patents for sophisticated electronic devices and was the CEO of Lear Siegler, Inc. Well, he was uh, the uh, chairman of the board of Lear Incorporated. It uh, merged finally with Siegler, Lear Siegler right. Incorporated. And uh, he had invented several uh, actuators and autopilots and so forth. He uh, had received the Collier Trophy for the F-86 autopilot. Even as his focus turned to building a business jet, he continued to develop new ideas, including the 8-track car stereo. But the high-performance business jet that would eventually bear his name was on his mind, even before he developed the 8-track. He began by surrounding himself with people who could help him make his dream a reality. Among them was well-known pilot and entrepreneur Clay Lacey. I have a speech somewhere, I haven't seen it for a while, that Bill Lear gave in 1959 in Wichita to the uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. And anyway, he uh, told the people in Wichita what uh, they should build. The, the jet airliners were coming along in 1959, 707s and DC-8s. And in this speech, Bill described this Learjet, uh, Learjet 23, and uh, what it should do. And he said, I'm giving you guys three years, I believe it was, to build it. If you haven't started on it in three years, I'm going to build it. And um, that was an absolute true statement. He did it. They didn't start on it, and he built it. Another key player in the history of the Learjet, even before it was designed, was a military test pilot by the name of Hank Beard. I heard he was uh, going to build, or he was talking about building rumors he was going to build this Learjet. And I just finished the spin test on the F-105, and I finished that program. So I wanted to get in on the early design and the flight of this one. 
Of course, in the late 50s, creating a business jet from scratch would obviously require a lot of experienced designers and significant sums of money. Thanks to his inventive genius, Bill had some money. And fortunately for him, in Switzerland, he was able to find some readily available engineering expertise and a platform upon which to base the design of his airplane. Under the direction of respected Swiss designer, Dr. Hans Studer, he began to build a team. Dr. Studer uh, was designing the uh, P-16 over at uh, FFA and it uh, had almost an identical wing to the Learjet, the one we used. In the meantime, Bill was down in Geneva designing a, a Learjet down there with his... <laughs> and so he found out about what Dr. Studer was doing and he said, Dr. Studer, I want you, since you designed that and they're not going to build it, I want you to take what you can off of that airplane and design me a hot rod Learjet. And since the wing was almost identical, uh, we, we, used the, we used all of that wind tunnel analysis for, that's all we had. We would have never had any money to run a wind tunnel test, so thank goodness uh, we were able to use that data. We first got over to uh, Switzerland, uh, the P-16 was just being canceled, and all these engineers, just like Wichita, had nothing to do. So Bill found these engineers at half price, like he said, he, he had an eye for that, and that's why we started designing it there. With Dr. Studer acting as chief designer, Bill Lear went about the task of picking off some of the industry's best talent to fill out his team. He hired Hank Waring from rival Cessna and Gordon Israel from Saberliner as well. If offering them the title of chief engineer was required to lure them away from their previous positions, Bill didn't hesitate. By the time Don Gromish, who would eventually hold the chief engineer's title himself, joined the company, the organizational chart was getting a little confusing. Uh, I've heard it described as an octopus. <laughs> well, we, we, Here was Bill Lear and he had these chief engineers and, yeah. and we, you, didn't, you didn't know who you were supposed to take orders from. Leading this diverse group, Bill Lear, the avionics genius, aircraft modifier and intrepid pilot, succeeded the way he always did, by the sheer force of his will and flying by the seat of his pants. I remember we were going up to Waldenburg, Switzerland to look at uh, these uh, uh, this watch company to make the landing gear and it had this little 3,000 foot uh, clover strip and we had that beach 18 you were talking about then when we were going out uh, Gordon Israel was the chief engineer at that time and he got in the back with two other big guys and here we are with a full load of an airplane and we got a uh, foot of alfalfa to take off in so I taxied uh, he was taxing out and I finished the taxi and put the tail right up against the fence on one end and I held the brakes until he got as much power as the tail started coming up off the ground. And we started rolling and we got down pretty close to the other end and it was kind of bumping along trying to get to flying. And the beach is kind of like a Lear Star. You don't use much flaps on takeoff, so I eased down about five degrees. And it finally came into the air on a bump just before we got to the fence on the other end. And it got in the air enough to get the gear up, so I pulled it up. And Gordon was so mad, he came up front and he said, Bill, he said, you should have been in the back of this airplane. So it scared the holy hell out of me. And Bill turned around and said, you should have been up here. <laughs> <laughs> With a Swiss design and an eclectic group of engineers from both Europe and the U.S., Bill eventually began searching for a place to build his corporate jet. Wichita, Kansas, the self-proclaimed air capital of the world, mounted an aggressive campaign to become the home of the new aircraft. But even as the hotbed of aviation manufacturing was making its bid to attract Learjet, many members of its aviation community were not so certain. Skeptics were legion. All over town, experts at competitors Cessna and Beach Aircraft made no qualms about their doubts that the Learjet would ever fly. Some, however, didn't see it that way and were willing to take a chance on being a part of history. I was with Beach, yeah. so I was across town sort of being one of the many skeptics that these, some of these guys had to encounter. But I think clearly he came here because this was where the labor market was. He could, he could attract great engineers, great manufacturing people, great pilots, great finance people, and he simply came here and took part of the best that was their offer in, in Wichita. And I remember sitting at Beach, uh, one by one, my colleagues would come over to Learjet 
and almost every month there would be a good buy party for somebody and it came to be known as uh, uh, we were the Italian boatmen, the gondoliers. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you weren't working in this plant, you were probably a skeptic. And, and the general consensus was the airplane will never be built. If it'll, it's built, it'll never fly. If it flies, it'll never be certified. If it's certified, it'll never get delivered. And of course, all of these things happen. And one by one, the, the dissent and the skepticism just melted away through performance. With his Italian boatmen and his band of international engineers, Bill Lear began piecing together an extraordinary airplane on the plains of Kansas. Well, I think we were pretty confident the airplane would fly. Uh, the only biggest problem we had was uh, time. Uh, the airplane, the airplane, obviously, uh, when we brought it over here, it didn't have any systems in it, and. Most of the systems were not even designed when, uh, when the first flight was, was going to take place. Uh, all I had to go on was the aerodynamics uh, that we had from the P-16, uh, and we had about two weeks to, to test the whole airplane and decide whether or not it was going to be airworthy. Bob Hagen and Hank Beard drew the assignment of piloting it on its first flight. Though an experienced military jet pilot, Hagen had been focusing on manufacturing while working at Learjet. Beard was working elsewhere. Having grown weary of waiting for Bill Lear to actually build the airplane he'd been raving about. As a result, both were blissfully unaware of how much they didn't know. Well, I'd have thought a lot more if I'd known what Don was saying. <laughs> yeah, if I'd have known all this. <laughs> if I'd known all this structural stuff, I, I don't know, we'd still be sitting on the ground, possibly. <laughs> he called me up one day and I heard the engines running. He opened the door so I could hear him. And uh, he said, Hank, uh, we're getting ready to fly this thing. And so I said, let me speak to June. June was a secretary, very much like Sylvia. June will tell you the truth. I said, now, June, uh, is the boss back in his office and you're outside? She says, yes. I said, tell me, is that airplane ready to fly? She said, it's running. From the first time he showed it to me on his boardroom table, I had no doubts about the airplane, whatever. Uh, the Eight spars in the wing. God, I've never flown an airplane with eight spars in the wing. Even 747s don't even have it. And five spars in the tail. What do you want for structure? Uh, what Hank was saying, uh, eight spars, the way this thing's built, it's built like a tank compared to other airplanes and compared to airliners, which are only designed to two and a half Gs. Uh, this airplane, when he tested the wing out here, static, Don, what, didn't it go up to like 13 and a half Gs or something before it broke? Never one to be accused of a hands-off management style, Lear got involved in virtually every aspect of the aircraft's development. He'd be out there on the, going around every drawing table, and you've probably seen pictures. Uh, I've got one classic where all the guys are laying over their table and Bill going around, and they don't want him to see what the heck they're doing <laughs> for fear he's going to sit there and change something. Because at night, when all these guys would go home, he was around and they had these pretty drawings they worked real hard on and he'd mark them up with a pencil. You'd come in the next morning and there's all this writing on your blackboard and with this WPL signed on it. And, you know, and you look at it and you try to figure out what in the world where the guy was trying to tell you. But, you know, in essence, the guy really had a lot of good concepts and, and you'd look at it, he'd give you the concept and he was expecting you to take that concept and put it on a piece of paper and make it work. Making it work became an obsession for everyone because it was imperative that the radical new jet aircraft prove itself in the air as soon as possible. By the afternoon of October 7th, they knew they were close. We didn't know we were going to fly that day. That day no, we didn't need to fly that day. Uh, <laughs> it was dark. So uh, Hank and I climbed in and uh, taxied out to runway 14, yeah. I believe it was. And he went one way and I went the other way, and that was the taxi run. We brought it back and said we're ready to go, so they fueled it up. And I took it off, and I think it was 120 we were supposed yeah. to climb out. I rotated and it took off, it stuck right at 120. Yeah, going up like a And just stopped there gone up in an airplane like that on takeoff. Got it up a few thousand feet and started wiggling it around a little bit. And I said, heck, that's all right with me. And yeah. let him fly it a little bit. 
Well, yeah. the airplane flew beautifully. Uh, I said it just like it was. The airplane was amazing, and it was. I, I expected it to be a rocket, and it was better than that. Mm -hmm. You come back around to land, cars were lined up oh, yeah. all along K-42 with their lights on. All, it was dark. Skip, all, the, all those skeptics were out there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Somebody called the radio station. Yeah. Yes. In fact, yes. uh, a lot of the guys yeah. were calling their families and telling them to get out yeah. there. And so the word spread quickly. Well, they were lined up for miles yeah. down there. And it's a, well, one when of I the was best coming sites, around the base leg, I could see everybody all down the highway. One of the best sights I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It turned out that October 7th was also Hagen's wedding anniversary, so he had a double reason to celebrate. His wife, however, may have seen it a bit differently. I got a first flight, and we also got dinner that night, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to take her out. <laughs>25 hours a day, Saturdays and Sundays. I, I always remember my wife used to bring our children out and they would play in Bill Lear's office on Saturdays and Moya would get be on the floor playing with him and that's when I got to see my family. The risk nearly proved disastrous, but the looming cloud proved to have a silver lining. The biggest thing that happened, cost the certification of time to be short, was crashing the first airplane. They were making rapid takeoffs and had one more to go and they wanted to shut the engine completely down rather than just pull it back to idle on one side. Uh, and it was beginning to rain, so they turned around and didn't retract the spoilers. And uh, they took off with the spoilers up and it flew for a mile and a half out here before it crashed. I think. That it seemed to me that when that airplane crashed and the FAA was involved with it, there was an FAA pilot in it, Bill gets on the phone with Barry Goldwater, Senator Kerr, everybody, everybody he knew, and he knew a bunch of people, and they got the head of the FAA on it. He gets on there and crying and with his big crocodile tears and kind of crying that they wrecked him. It his, uh, all of his money's in this airplane, and it was wrecked. And finally they said, what can we do to help you at this point? And he says, have someone here 24 hours a day until we get this airplane, and Bill would schedule is scheduled test flights for about eight in the morning but the engine would be off there's a yeah. lot of problems by the time they got around to hank flying with him about nine ten o'clock at night i think the, they got done in about an hour what it would have taken two flights earlier in the day you know? uncharacteristically bill had taken some extra precautions with his first airplane and had it fully insured when the insurance company paid off the first learjet to fly the first learjet to be lost in a crash also became the first Learjet to be sold at full list price. The proceeds helped keep the company going and the program alive. We were glad it happened from an engineering standpoint because the airplane we, we used had most of the uh, Swiss parts in there and they were all in the metric system. We could have never certified that airplane. So that airplane was sold <coughs> at retail as you say and, and uh, we would have never realized a dime out of that airplane if it hadn't crashed. Bill Lear and his intrepid band of airplane builders continued to live a charmed life, even if money was tight. In a period of just over nine months, they accomplished what many were still convinced was impossible. I think I would have to say that getting the type certificate on the airplane was the greatest thrill that we ever had because until, unless we got it certificated, we didn't have a company. We couldn't sell an airplane. You know, that, that was our baby. It, it became the Learjet. You know, when it, when it flew, it was a Learjet, but when we got that type certificate, that meant the company, well, we could even borrow money. I mean, here we had something firm in our hands. We were, we, we were a company now. Without, the, without that type certificate, we were nothing. Bill Lear wasn't just the airplane's designer and chief financial source, he was its premier salesman as well. 
Originally, look, the first few Learjets were sold by Bill Lear himself, to, like Law Guinness and Barrett Thies, and those are people he knew before. But even with a stable full of high-profile customers and their deposits, money was tight. Once the airplane was certified, Bill Lear declared that the market for business jets was large and growing. In 1963, the, 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 the consensus through, through research that was done was that ultimately, for all time, there would be 300 business jets bought. <laughs> And Bill Lear came along and said, no, that easily 3,000. And people absolutely laughed him out of, of, of the room. In an effort to meet the demand, Learjet production accelerated faster than Bill Lear could afford. The business formula in the first year of production evolved into selling airplanes in order to make the company's payroll. There was a, a civil war in Nigeria, and Biafra became an independent republic. And I had a call from the State Department that the President, Colonel Ojupo, wants a private airplane. So I said, okay, I'm on the way. Where, where the hell is Biafra? I'm on the way. <laughs> and in New York, I got a call from, maybe it was either you or Harvey Anselm. It's come back. Bill said, well, we don't have the money to go to Africa now. And I said, well, pretend you didn't get a hold of me. <laughs> and I went on. When I got there, and a man in a dirty shirt, open shirt, come, khakis comes up to me behind me and he whistled me, be off run intelligence, come with me. <laughs> and they, we sold the airplane. That paid the last payroll. <laughs> I always remember Alex coming home and in his bag, he literally carried that darn stuff in his back pocket, check and cash hanging out of his back pocket, walking around the plant, and he, that's your payroll, he'd say, pat his back. <laughs> there was this there's Brazilian uh, big rancher and, uh, in Sao Paulo who signed the contract, and I said, I need $100,000 deposit, we required at the time. He says, you'll have it before you leave. So I'm leaving. Uh, this afternoon by airline. Okay, no deposit. Uh, I'm waiting at the, to board the airplane. Now here comes a man with a little neatly wrapped brown paper box. He says, here, what is this? I said, it's your deposit. Uh, I said, well, I, won't, I, I look at it. I said, they go into a little office. I said, I'm gonna count it. Christ, there were $5 bills, $10 bills, travel those checks. Uh, all in a bomb bag. <laughs> no, and nothing, uh, no way I could count that. In the meantime, they called the flight. And the man, man said, okay, here are the receipts, signed $100,000. <laughs> well, I signed, I stuffed all this in a Varig six sack, because it was illegal to take money out of Brazil. <laughs> and I come here and I walk into Bill's office and I, on his desk, and I turned the six up like this. <laughs> Cash everywhere. <laughs> money everywhere. And then he calls me. He says, uh, it's $100 short. <laughs> I said, Bill, if I'm going to steal money from the company, it's going to be more than $100. <laughs> By virtue of their extraordinary performance, Learjets rapidly became the talk of the aviation industry. But with the new aircraft, a new potential set of customers was emerging. Bill Lear knew it was important to reach these prospective members of the jet set, and he put his PR and marketing experts onto the assignment. Yeah, in those days when Bill wanted to make the name a household word, he th thought the easiest way to do it was to get uh, celebrities in. And, and uh, man, I'd have to think about it, but we probably flew 100 people that were well known in those days. And, and a lot of them were his friends, like Art Linkletter had been a friend of Bill's for a long time. And, and, uh, but uh, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., and just about everybody uh, that was uh, in Hollywood uh, flew in the airplane. But even with the beautiful people clamoring to own or fly in a Learjet, there were still business and opinion leaders who needed to be convinced and the competition had begun to make some noises of its own. So we leaped uh, ahead at getting the Learjet featured in movies. Clay was a big part of that. Uh, on television shows, in other people's advertising, both print and broadcast, 
We went on tours with Hank, uh, with movie stars, things like that, to promote their movies. Danny Kaye took a Learjet around on a UNICEF tour. Uh, Hank Ketchum, the, uh, the creator of Dennis the Menace cartoon, was living in Switzerland, I think, at the time. And occasionally he would get rides or flights in Learjets, maybe with Bill Jr. And, and, and every time uh, Mr. Ketchum would get a ride in a Learjet on his uh, next cartoon episode of Dennis the Menace would be a little cartoon uh, figure of the Learjet on Dennis the Menace's wall. So it was in hundreds of comic strips all, of, all over the country. So you always knew when he'd gotten a ride because there'd be a picture of a Learjet. Uh, part of this component were, were world record flights. Uh, to attract attention to the performance of the airplane. Time to climb to 40,000 feet, cross country, Clay did that, LA to New York and back, international flights, altitude flights. Uh, but these around the world flights were the capstone of the whole thing. Uh, and at one point in 1965, a very highly publicized jet commander flight, a competitor uh, with uh, Arthur Godfrey on board, was getting a lot of attention. And uh, Bill Lear said, well, we can know we can go around faster. Our, what we'll do is we'll get Hank and other people in the airplane. We'll fly around the world silently first before the Godfrey flight. And then when they come back, we'll say congratulations, but we've already done it. And by the way, we beat your time quite a bit. So this all happened very rapidly. And uh, the day of the flight, the strategy on PR was changed to get all the publicity you possibly can on this flight. We had done no preparation at all, none. These guys left and Jim and I were on the phones immediately calling everybody and uh, around the world and uh, wire services and networks and so forth. We worked throughout that whole night. They left in the afternoon, as I remember. Uh, we worked all that night calling people and so forth. We went home about five in the morning to shave and get a shower. Jim Greenwood was in the shower about 7 in the morning and gets a call from Bill Lear who had turned on the Today Show and there was no news of this around the world flight. He said, Greenwood, this is the best kept secret since the atom bomb. <laughs> uh, we carried uh, one can of oil as spare. We brought it back. And that's about all the spare parts we carried. And every place we stopped, the airplanes that were making trips around the world while we were having, had supplies at every base they were landing. And of course, they always want to know was Arnie was uh, Arthur Godfrey on board? Yeah. <laughs> and when they weren't circling the globe in record time, Learjets were setting new standards for altitude performance, flying higher than any other non-military jet. I remember when uh, the Lear was real new, and Bill would be uh, flying it somewhere, and uh, no one was up real high, you know, and, and it was only five Lears flying or so, so everybody would listen up and hear Lear and Bill come on the radio and say, uh, this is Lear uh, 802LJ at uh, flight level 460, and I mean 410. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was so, going south with Jim Burt of Mexico City, and at the border, the Mexican control, of course, they didn't have any altitude capability, says uh, descent to 39 or 0, there's opposite traffic at 410. And, uh, Jim says, oh, the hell with them, we'll go to 430 and tell them, tell them to be at 39. So I report in that we are now level at 39 or 0, and I see this contrail coming <laughs> at 410. And it was F. Lee Bailey. Yeah, F. Lee Bailey. And I told him who we were, and uh, as he passes underneath, uh, there comes this cryptic voice, he says, Alex, if you are at 390, I'm flying upside down. <laughs> <laughs> but even with its astounding performance, the Learjet couldn't build itself. And Bill Lear finally realized he was about to run out of money long before he ran out of ideas. In 1967, he made a stunning decision, selling the company that he had founded. That was building the revolutionary airplane that bore his name and had launched a whole new segment of aviation to the Gates Rubber Company. The Gates Rubber Company came in with considerable financial stability, which allowed us to do some things in product development and so forth. Uh, and, and the fact that we needed to expand this owner base into these l larger corporations and so forth, I, I think that was a good shifting of strategy. We were maturing as an organization. We had to mature as an organization. 
and we couldn't just be the, 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 the flying by the seat of our pants as we had succeeded in doing for the first four or five years. The, the, it was the, the time was right, I think, to move on and to move out. It's been 36 years since the Bill Lear era at Learjet ended, but the legacy he left behind continues. Learjet has become a household name, a virtual generic term for a business jet. Over the years since that first Lear 23 caused that memorable early evening traffic jam in Wichita, Learjets have continued to make their marks. The Learjet 28 and 29 were the first business jets certified to cruise at 51,000 feet, above most of the weather and all of the traffic. Well, some of, you know, when we went around the world, they weren't, yeah. if you got above 50, they didn't care where you went. They didn't even ask you your altitude. We're going to run in there. Yeah, well, that's and for sure. we were uh, trying to get over monsoons down in the Philippines and whatnot. We were 55 a lot of the time. During the 70s and 80s, the Learjet 35 also set records of its own for sales, becoming one of the world's most popular light jets. In the 13 years since it was acquired by Bombardier, Learjet has benefited from an infusion of cash and creativity. The Learjet family of jets has experienced a renaissance of sorts. By the time Learjet celebrated the 30th anniversary of its first flight, two new Learjet models, the 31 and the 60, were in development. And in 1997, the first all-new Learjet since the Model 23, the Learjet 45, was certified as well. The new models 40 and 45XR debuted in 2002 and will enter service later this year. In the decades since, Bombardier has revitalized and refined the Learjet family, rekindling the excitement of the legendary performance leaders. Today, 40 years after its first model flew, and 100 years after Wilbert and Orville Wright launched the era of powered flight, the Bombardier Learjet family, the models 40, 45, 45XR, and 60, continues to offer business travelers a unique combination of comfort and performance and Bombardier has made owning and operating a Learjet easier and more affordable through its FlexJet fractional ownership program and SkyJet charter service as well as conventional purchase. Though the concept of fractional ownership may seem relatively new, it seems Bill Lear may have had something pretty similar in mind four decades ago, even before that historic first flight. Uh, a fellow named Eve McDonald uh, was ordered one of the first Lears and I flew him out to Palm Springs. He called me one day, said, can you pick me up in the morning? I want to go out and see Bill Lear. Bill wants me to come out to Palm Springs and Justin Dart was there uh, and Bill was ready to go to Switzerland to uh, uh, build the airplane. But before he went, he wanted to be able to say, honestly say that he had some orders. So Justin Dart ordered two, and um, McDonald ordered one. It was the uh, first three orders, and they were for $275,000 a piece. <laughs> and I remember Bill saying they're all going to look alike. They're all going to be have a red stripe, and the interior was going to be the same in every one. And he says, I'm, uh, he said, I'm just waiting for the day. He said that. McDonald, uh, your airplane won't be available, but uh, they'll borrow the Dart's airplane and he'll take off and he'll say, what happened to my magazines I left in here? Because <laughs> he said you won't be able to tell the difference. As it turned out, Bill Lear launched not only his own dream, but a legend, an industry, and a family of airplanes that have helped make a lot of other dreams come true. The colorful and exciting stories of those early days may have faded. But Bombardier's family of Learjet aircraft continues to make new memories and set new standards for performance and quality.